to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. We're thankful to be in the service again tonight. We're glad to see each one that's here. Matthew chapter 23. I guess I've had this thought on my heart somewhere, I guess, along the middle of the week. The Lord began to work on me about this. And I really don't like preaching from Matthew chapter 23, but yet again, the Lord don't ask me what I like. Uh, it's, a, it's a very difficult chapter. Sometimes we find ourselves trying to do the right thing and doing our best to do the right thing but finding ourselves in the place where we are failing to do the right thing but because we've lost focus of what the right thing is and that's where the Pharisees are at I think there's a part I think there were a group of Pharisees. I think there were some that, I think the scripture bears this out, that there were some that you can see who were dead set against things. But I think there was an underlying group of Pharisees who wanted to do the right thing. Nicodemus, I think you see him being a part of that group. Nicodemus wanted to do what's right. He come to the Lord by night. I think Nicodemus ended up getting saved from what I can see in the Scripture. May have possibly, I don't think the Scripture gives us a definitive answer, but I believe that Nicodemus got saved in the end. But one of the things that Nicodemus wanted to do, I believe he wanted to serve the Lord, but I think he had got caught up in part of this, and he was acting out. He had become a part of the group of the Pharisees, so he was doing these things, and he had lost sight. So what Jesus is telling them, I'm going to begin reading in verse 3, is that they've lost sight of some things. Verse 23 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and nice and cumin, have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done, and not to leave the other undone, you blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. So Jesus here is giving them an example, one example, of how they have become hypocritical. And one of the, or rather, not only become hypocritical, but have left out the weightier matters. And so what I, I think what you see is when you look at some like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, uh, who also, I believe, got saved in the end, that a part of going along with the Pharisees and part of what the Pharisees had done is maybe there were some whose heart was not in the right place. Maybe there were some who... Uh, or not trying to serve the Lord, but there were some, no doubt, that were. They just didn't know how. And by doing what they had always done, by following those who were, uh, th- that had led all the time, and just by, by, I guess, meeting the status quo of the religion of that day, they found themselves doing the little things, but leaving out the humongous things leaving out the things that were of great importance. And so Jesus tells them here, he says that ye have omitted the weightier matters. This is something that I think we oftentimes as churches find ourselves struggling with. I think we find ourselves struggling. A lot of times we don't say it in so much of a way uh, I don't. I don't usually say it this way. I don't say you know we've left out the weightier matters. You, what I usually say is we've gotten the car ahead of the horse. And we're trying to do one thing when there's a lot of other things that we need to be doing beforehand. There's a lot of other things rather that are maybe a little bit more important. So let's go back and look at this in its context. We're going to go through the context and then uh, try to get to what Jesus is saying and trust that there's something that we can. Learn here for each of us tonight. Verse 23, he begins with woe. This is not an uncommon statement. In verse 20, or chapter 23, Jesus is pronouncing woes 
to the Pharisees. Woe is an interesting word. Woe means judgment. Ho means stop. Woe means judgment. That there is judgment that is coming. Okay? So it's something that you, when you hear woe, it means you better pay attention, you better get on the right road, or there's supposed to be some things that take place. You go over to, I believe it's Revelation chapter uh, 8, I believe it is, and the angels, as God begins to, the seventh trumpet sounds, and uh, the, the or, or rather the seventh seal is broken, and the trumpets begin to sound, and as the fourth trumpet sounds, an angel makes a statement and says, Woe, woe, woe. And somewhere about the middle of chapter 9, it says, uh, one of the angels says, One woe is past, and there are yet two more woes. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the woes of judgment that are being poured out upon this earth for the things that they have done, for the failures to trust the Lord Jesus Christ, for the things that the earth does, has done in running away from the Lord and not following God's path. And I mean, when you go back and you read those woes in Revelation chapter 8 and chapter 9, that it is, it's some things that you're like, man, I'm thankful that I'm not going to be here when that happens. Because it is awful. It is awful to think about. Well, I think at that particular time, in one woe, one-third of every human being on earth, one-third of all human beings on earth are killed. One woe. That's, that's tough. Woe is used all throughout the Old Testament. It's an attention word. It's telling us, and I don't think it's just something that, again, you have to understand the character of God to get this. God is not, and God, there's one group of people, and I want you to think about this. I asked a man a question one day as a pastor and how I was to handle a situation. And he, he didn't tell me what I wanted to hear, but he said, you've got to be very straightforward, you've got to be very blunt, and you've got to tell them the truth. I said, well, I'm afraid of how that's going to go over. And he said, you remember one thing, there is one group of people that Jesus was very tough on. And he said, that's the Pharisees. And he made me stop and, and step back and think for a moment. And, and he's right. Jesus was very tough on the Pharisees, but he had to be. He had to be because they weren't getting it. They weren't realizing. And so Jesus was being tough on these people. And so you read the language of it and you're like, man, this is, <laughs> Jesus is being tough. But he had to be. And so when Jesus is saying the word woe, it's not that, yeah, y'all got judgment coming and I want to see it happen. No, it's please stop. Please turn around. Because God, at the end of the day, does not take pleasure in bringing judgment upon people. God does not take pleasure in, in, in doing these things. But if you don't quit, if you keep going the way you're going, woe is in your future. Does that make sense? So that's the, that's the way that Jesus is saying this to these Pharisees. Woe. This is the path that you're on. Okay? And so, again, what were they, what were they doing? Their course was off. They were uh, off course. And so Jesus gives us a, a bit of, uh, he gives us one particular, again, they've left out. What he, his point here is that they've left out the weightier matters of the law. But what he, is, is, he gives us as an example, he says that you pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin. Now, if you go back and you look at these, these are herbs. And so you can imagine the fields that they've planted. You can imagine the fields outside of Jerusalem and in these areas and what these fields would look like. I mean, when you have a, a huge crop, just say you think of a 40-acre field and how big a 40-acre field would be planted with corn or in their day they'd plant wheat or barley and you think of a, a, a tenth of that would be four acres. So four acres of that crop would be, would be marked out. Roughly four acres of that crop would be marked out as a tithe. That's a pretty good bit of, pretty good bit of, of, of crop in four acres. If you've got a 40-acre field planted. 
But how much mint do you need? How much cumin did they plant? And so you've got, I mean, what, they have a cumin patch, a little bit of, how big a space? I don't know. i tell you what I've grown up. Mama used to, and still plants herbs at the house. And she, a little bit of plant go a long way when it comes to herbs. And yet, however big this patch of mint, cumin, these herbs, they are marking out 10% to make sure that they don't miss anything. This is so, this is the, the, the point that Jesus is saying is you've got so hyper-focused upon the details of the law that you've left out the important stuff. You've completely walked away from the important things. You've gotten so hyper-focused upon what you think God is waiting. You're not serving the Lord in what God wants. You're serving God in what you think God wants. Does that make sense? That's what he's telling the Pharisees. Okay? You, you are so, in your self-righteous have gotten to the place... That, that, and Jesus is correcting their behavior. You've gotten to the place that you're marking out 10%. Not that that doesn't need to be done. And not that that's not a good thing. But in the light of leaving out faith, which one's more important? Faith or, or paying 10% tithes with men? And so if, if, if you notice what he, again, what he's doing, and then you, you think of this for a moment. You think of them trying to do those things, and then at the same time, where's the mercy? They're being judgmental of one another, and there's so much politics you can read, and you see as Jesus is correcting these men, the political angles that they're taking to do everything to keep Jesus from being the Christ. Why? Because at the end of the day, they crucified him for envy's sake. They're envious of the fame of Jesus Christ. They've become political in their nature. And they've become focused upon the wrong things. And he says they've omitted the weightier matters of the law. They've neglected the important thing. Today I want us to take a moment to, to look at ourselves. One thing I think that it's again important to do, and as we come to church we always uh, should examine ourselves to look at ourselves with the message that God sends and adjust, and adjust our course of action in, in, in tune with what God is telling us. Sometimes if we're not careful, we can find ourselves as a church, we want to do a lot of stuff. And we want to do a lot of good. We want to work in our community we have a burden maybe to do things. We have a desire to grow. I think we all have that desire. We all like to see our churches succeed. And we want to be a part of a church that is working and that is succeeding. I think sometimes, I think that's common among us. Sometimes we may differ in exactly how that's supposed to take place. But if we're not careful, we can find ourselves trying to do so much that we have forgotten the most important thing. And we've left that out. I had to be rough with a man one day. He came to me just having a discussion. and he, was, he, 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 he came to me and said, well, we need to do this as a church. And we need to do this as a church. And we need to do this as a church. And, <clears throat> you know, always have a bunch of ideas. And one of the things that I started doing is just putting him in charge of everything. I think that's a good idea. Head it up. God put it on your heart for a reason. You put it together and we'll do it. After about four or five times, I, I, I'd gotten to the place that I, 
came home and I told Crystal, I said, uh, I think what we need to do is we need to figure out how to come to church. And when we get figured out how to come to church and do church, then we need to reach out and start doing some other things. But we've lost sight of the most important things. We've lost sight in this particular place. We've lost sight of what we're supposed to be doing. We've lost sight. And so there's, a, there, there's the things, that, that, that the outreach, and, and the things that in our minds seem like a fun thing. And it's enjoyable, and we'll do this, and it seems we have, you know, have the, the things that, that maybe voice us a little bit and, and maybe help us to look good and, and have a good face or a good facade. But, but when it comes to the things that, that, that are the grind, that are, that are the things that are difficult, How many people did you tell about Jesus this week? How many people did you talk to about the Lord Jesus Christ and you tell them and you talk to them about they need, they need him to trust the Lord Jesus Christ? How many did you talk to this week? That's a convicting, convicting statement. It's a convicting idea. But I think of all the things that we're supposed to be doing, that's probably number one, isn't it? In fact, the Bible tells us and shows us that with the book of Ephesians, that, or rather the, the letter to the Ephesian church in the book of Revelation, that that is so important that if we stop doing that, he'll take the candlestick away. That's how important it is. There's, and again, Jesus is not saying leave the other undone. He's saying that, yes, that needs to be done as well, but this is, needs to be your focus. Sometimes we find ourselves... By the way, you look at, again, what he says... He says that you've left out, the now here they are, they marking out these patches of cumin and the patches of mint and all of these herbs. And he says you've left out judgment, you've left out mercy, and you've left out faith. They are the cornerstones of what we do. Without judgment, mercy, and faith, what is left? In other words, that we can do all of the other things and make the appearances and, and do all of that. But what have we done without faith? You go over then to the book of Hebrews and we find out that the reason that these men were such men of God and obtained such a record was because of their faith. One of the things that we need to be doing is we need to be working on our faith. Which means we need to grow in the Lord. We should have a burning desire in us as a child of God to grow in the Lord. You should have a burning desire within you to read and study God's Word. And if that's not there, something's wrong. Something's a matter. And you would do well to find out what that matter is. Because we should have a desire to keep going. So notice what he says next is the next thing that happens kind of in this succession. Not only have they omitted the weightier matters of the law, they, they should do those and not to leave the other undone. They should do those. But he says what they've ended up doing is they've ended up straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. They end up getting so focused on the little things that the little things are... Uh, the, the, the little things are, are causing the divisions among them. The little things is what's causing them to look down upon others and, and have this disdain and lack of mercy for others. And they're willing to throw them down real quick. And they're willing to get rid of them and all of that kind of thing. But when it comes to judgment and when it comes to mercy and when they're presented with their own sinful conditions, they're willing to overlook that. Because now you've put them in the crosshairs. Judgment, mercy. So what it becomes if we're not careful is that the things that are important to us will be the most important things. 
Well, every one of us have things that are important to us. Every one of us have things that we would like to see. But there again, what makes a church function and operate as it should, like an old machine, is people willing to overlook their desires and their wants for the good of the whole, that we could learn of the Lord and that we could come together as a body. It's integrity. Straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel. I grew up in a church, and probably most of y'all know a little bit. I, I've probably told y'all enough from up here about the church I grew up in that you know somewhat about it. There's a lot of, a lot of things in a lot of ways the church I grew up failed. But there's a few ways that they did some things that I learned from. I want to tell you one of the ways that I learned. I knew one thing and I knew it for an absolute fact. I watched it happen time and time and time again. If you made a mistake as a member of that church, I'll just put it, use me as an example. This is not something I questioned. This is not something I wondered about. It's not something where I wondered if it would happen. I knew it would happen. If I stepped out of line, I didn't have to worry about the members of that church coming to see me. My daddy would ring up charges against me in the church. My daddy. If I step out of line as a pastor here, Y'all have nothing to worry about. Clay will come through those doors and he'll make sure that you do what you're supposed to do and that I don't preach anymore. I don't, what I'm telling y'all is I don't just have to try to be straight because of y'all that my own family looks at me that way. Why? Because it's not thick with them. It's not okay to just do it to everybody else. And we're going to discipline and we're going to look down on everybody and we're going to do all that we need to do until the time that it comes to our doorstep. You know, some folks are that way. They're all about discipline. All about church discipline. All about this, the, the, the way that we need to discipline everybody and everybody needs to act a particular way and we need to do it correctly till it winds up on their doorstep. Then we're going to walk a different road. But that's when it comes to faith, you better believe in it. You know my, why my daddy would do that? Because he wants to see me walk right. And he knows that if he disciplines me, the Lord's going to work on me. And that's what he wants to happen. He wants the Lord working on me. You judge them that are within, and I'll judge those that are without. You put me out, that way God will judge. The point that I'm making is that if we're not careful, we'll present a face that we're so about something until it gets to our doorstep. And then we see that we're not near about it as we thought we were. Integrity, okay? Integrity is doing the right thing regardless of who's looking or who's paying attention or how bad it hurts. And one of the things that we lack in our society today, and I believe even in our churches, is integrity. We have the tendency to put up a facade. The tendency to present a face to the people that we want. We're going to show everybody who we are. Rather, I'm going to show everybody who I want to be. But when I get off and it's just me and the Lord, I do what I want to. Don't nobody know about that. I was a member at a church one day, and a man came to me, and he had just gotten back from a cruise. Mind you, this man had a position at church, and I did as well. 
And he said, you need to go on one of them cruises. And I said, I've always wanted to. I'd never have. I said, but I think that, you know, usually they go some pretty, pretty, some pretty places, that, some places I'd like to see, but I, I don't know. He said, but now let me tell you, he said, if you go on that cruise, he said, you get out there and you have you some fun. He said, because there ain't nobody on that boat that you know, and what happens on that boat stays on that boat. I said, is that right? He said, yeah. I said, God ain't out there. The point that I'm trying to make is God knows what God knows what's going on. If I was to act like that out there, you know what God would do to me back here. Why? Why have integrity? Integrity is not because somebody's prideful or think that they're better than somebody else. It comes and it, 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 it's a, 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 a derivative of fear of the Lord. That I don't fear the descent of my name. I don't fear my name being drugged through the mud. I'm not too concerned about what people think of me at the end of the day, although I do the best that I can for the Lord's sake to keep my name out of certain places so that I can actually preach the gospel and be effective. But if I go down for doing the right thing, then I just go down and I leave it with the Lord. Why? Because at the end of the day, the Lord controls all of that. We've got to realize those things. So we get, you look at this group of people that they, they, what they've done is that exactly they've gotten the cart ahead of the horse. They're, they're trying to do all of these little things and so much so that they've come hyper fixated on the little things and they think they're, they're okay. And in their mind, they're right because they're, they're self-righteous, but they've left off the important things. And th- tonight what's on my heart is that we adjust, we look at ourselves to make sure that we haven't done the same. And that we're at the end of the day, we're focused on getting the gospel out. And that our focus was on reaching the community that, we're, that we are in and that we live in and that we're associating in. That we, that we read and study our Bibles that when folks come to us, they say, well, why do y'all believe this in such a way? Why do y'all believe it this way? That we don't have to try to figure it out or try to let go back, and stuff, but that we can open the Bible and show them plainly that we could grow in the Lord and that we could have faith and that we could practice mercy One of the things that I have, to me, there's a lot of the Bible that as you study, it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper and you can't find any end to it. When you study those seven church letters in the book of Revelation, it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. You can align those up with the seven parables in Matthew chapter 13 and you find the degradation over a period of time. And I believe to some degree that that represents the church age. To the degree that's the case, I don't, I don't know. I think it just, just, but at the same time, I believe that it obviously, I don't believe that, that you can see that those were literal churches that Jesus wrote to that were in existence in that time. And I believe also as well, we can find ourselves in different stages of that and we can deal with some of the issues that those churches dealt with. But when you look at Matthew chapter 13 and you align that up, the very first thing that happens, the very first step in the degradation of the church is that the church walks away from the first love. That's number one. And they become focused on something else. They become focused on their appearance. Or they become so focused upon uh, uh, maybe a, 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 a specific thing about to, to be a, a doctrinal thing or whatever it may be that you, you walk away from the Lord. That there's no longer a desire to know Jesus. There's no longer a desire to just be in love with Him. To walk with Him. Every day. 
to realize that Jesus is not some character. It's just at the right hand of God somewhere and that we just, you know, kind of worship him here and there. But he walks with us every day of our life. And he desires to be with us and live with us. And that we read the word of God, not that we could just go through the Bible and answer our conscience, but that we could know him greater. And that we could know him in a more deep level. Today, one of the things I think we need to do as a church is we need to focus upon Jesus. And we need to turn our eyes on him and not leave the other undone, but to remember who we serve and that we would pray for ourselves that God would give us a desire, a burning desire to know his word, to know Jesus. Let me ask you this question. What was it that Paul desired more than anything else? He tells us, Philippians chapter 3, and he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Today there is nothing in this world that's like walking with Jesus. There's nothing in this world like knowing the person of Jesus Christ. And one of the reasons we find ourselves struggling so much with our desires is because we find that we've found ourselves leaving off the things of Christ. We find saying that, you know, maybe that we don't have time. That we don't have time to study. And, you know, maybe, it, 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 maybe you don't have a, a ton of time. Pick a book. And start studying. You may not get through but three verses, but make sure that you know what them three verses say. And then move on to three more. Before you know it, a month's time. A month's time, and you've covered a book. You do that 66 times, five and a half years, the whole Bible. And you ain't just read it. You've studied it, book by book. One of the things that I've tried to teach my children One of the things that I've, as a father, I'll give you two of them. When it comes to the responsibilities of, the li of life and the things that we are to do in life, I can only show you where they are. I can't, I can't give you a desire. I can't make you do them. You have to come up with that desire and pray that the Lord will give you that desire to do that yourself. If I could teach you anything, this is the second, if I could teach you anything as a parent, it's the same thing I would teach my children. If I could teach my children anything as a parent when it comes to religion, when it comes to church work, I don't want my children to be faithful to church. I don't want my children to be faithful to a name. I don't want my children to be faithful in just reading their Bible and saying their prayers every day. I want to teach my children to love God. And if I can succeed in teaching my children to love God, then I don't have to worry about teaching them the rest of it because they'll do it. Today when we look at us, and we say, what's missing? 
Let me ask you, how much do you love him? And have we left that part out? Have we left that part out? The day when we find ourselves at church, is it I'm going to church or I get to go worship the Lord to learn about the Lord Jesus Christ and to spend some time with him? Today, if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves in a similar condition. And when we find ourselves in that condition that we're focused on those little bitty things that we've left off the weightier matters, woe is us. Woe is us. Because we're following that same path. And that path leads to judgment for us just like it led to judgment for them. So we, may, we need to make sure that our path is the proper one. And that we're on the path to loving God, to having integrity, and not walking in the sight of man, but walking in the sight of God every day of our life. That we could live a life of integrity for Him, and that we could love Him as we should. And if we all do that, we can see some wonderful things here while we have a verse of a song.